Okay, so we have part two, uh, carrying on this discussion. It's going to be um, really just expanding on this piece of the puzzle on the discussion about the plant immunity, defense chemicals, how we can um, use nutrients to support this process um, to fuel the plant's own immune system. Um, that's going to be really the thrust of the talk, and but we'll also talk about how some nutrients can also be part of the physical defenses, the barriers that also can um, help to prevent pests and disease. Now let's dive into um, some specifics on plant nutrition. And uh, of course it all starts with photosynthesis. This is how plants grow. They breathe in that carbon dioxide, they take up the water, they stitch that together to form sugar, CHO, that carbohydrate, that glucose molecule. And that's really the building block of how plants then grow their bodies and do everything uh, that they do. But in order for them to, to fuel this photosynthetic process, in order for this to, um, to function properly, plants don't just need the air, the water and the sunlight, they also need nutrients. And of course those nutrients come from the soil and that's the essential macronutrients, all of the micronutrients. And so these are the fundamental ingredients that we need. Yes, it's the energy, the CO2, the water, the nutrients from the soil. And together, they all prime photosynthesis, drive photosynthesis, and therefore um, drive plant production. And now that is true in terms of production, and it's also true in terms of plant immunity and helping the plant, having the right ingredients to fuel the production of those defense chemicals because it, it's the nutrients that catalyze the photosynthesis and then those products of photosynthesis are stitched together in various ways which again nutrients are catalyzing that process um, to build the various um, defense chemicals. So if we take that uh, simple equation here and just represent it with a little bit more detail, I'm really just saying the same thing. It's about bringing together the CO2, the water and the essential nutrients. That it's the macro and micronutrients that act as enzymes, as part of enzymes or catalysts. They are catalyzing this process. And therefore then we have sugar as the very first product of photosynthesis, the glucose molecule plus oxygen for us. And the point here is, is that then once we have that building block, the glucose molecule, then the plant will begin to stitch that together in specific kind of ways and structures and patterns. It will link in other nutrients to that like sulfur or nitrogen to build other compounds as well. All sorts of things. Everything comes from that building block. So we stitch them together to build more complex sugars and carbohydrates. We add in the nitrogen, the sulfur, we make the little amino acids, we stitch them together to build proteins for example. And onwards and onwards, lots of other things, the lipids, the waxy layers in the plants, the cuticle, um, some of the plant growth compounds, the hormones that they produce internally, phytohormones, vitamins, things of course that we eat for us, the colors, the pigments, the flavors, the smells, the scents. I talked about those aromatic smelly compounds earlier. All of those things come from ultimately primary photosynthesis to turn gas, CO2, into something physical, into sugar. And then we turn that sugar into all of these other or rearrange the carbon in that sugar and, and build all of these other um, compounds, which then also includes defense chemicals, protective compounds, compounds. So again, the plant can produce antifungal or antibiotic substances internally that can block pathogens or it can produce um, um, insecticidal type compounds inside of it that when insects consume it upsets their digestion or its deterrence, these kinds of things. Okay, so that's the fundamentals of plant growth, it's photosynthesis, but again in order for that second step we also need the essential nutrients, all the macro and micros to help drive these secondary processes, building these secondary metabolites and these secondary compounds after the, pr the process of primary photosynthesis. And that's then where we could probably do a whole very long, long full day session on the ins and outs of plant nutrition. I'm really going to focus on the key nutrients here today that have a specific plant immunity link. So we're not going to do a tour of all plant nutrition, but I am going to focus on the key minerals that help with um, this pest and disease 
topic that we're here to talk about. But I just want to emphasize that all of the nutrients are important. These are all of the essential nutrients. The plant is, um, requires all of these in adequate amounts in order to thrive, in order to be healthy, in order to be productive, but also to be um, immune, to drive some of those immune processes. So when we talk about plant nutrition, yes, I acknowledge that we need to be holistic in our view. It's not just about NPK, it's not just about nitrogen, it's also about all of them. They all play a role. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be applying them all, but we have to be aware of them all and um, be managing them all. And so all of those various nutrients, basically, they work in here, the gold writing here, they work as part of enzymes or catalysts. Um, we need the nutrient to build the enzyme and then the enzyme is what's kind of facilitating the, the conversion or this photosynthetic process. Now, if we talk about photosynthesis in this generalized plant growth and development and kind of productive capacity, when we're trying to manage plant nutrition to boost yield or to, to maintain production, um, the exact same processes that we're trying to achieve there are the same when we're trying to enhance plant immunity and to build plant resistance against pests and disease. So for example, here's photosynthesis on the slide. If we were talking about trying to boost the plant's health and immunity against insects, if we're trying to, for example, build insect resistance, it would look like this. So it's the same, but what's changed here is just the secondary compounds are now are different. So we're, again, we're using the building block, we need essential nutrients, but now we're building these anti-feedant, um, anti-herbivory type compounds that are distasteful to the insects or upset their digestion. These are some of the other defense chemicals that help to suppress um, the insects. Cell strengtheners, structural barriers, we're going to talk about this at length as we go along. Some of those deterrent chemicals, I mentioned the volatiles, the smells and scents that deter the pest or attract in the beneficial insect to help. So it's all of these, again, the point here, as you can see, is that it's just a different selection of secondary chemicals that are being produced. Um, but again, we need the right nutrients to facilitate those to turn the building block into all of those. Now, if we were to talk about disease management, it's also exactly the same. It's still about managing plant nutrition to optimize photosynthesis to get the building block, then to turn that building block into just a different selection of compounds. Antibiotic types, those antifungal type compounds, these antimicrobial type things, again, physical barriers and these types of things. So just helping the plant synthesize defense chemicals that are specific against fungi or bacteria or insects, etc. But the fundamentals of the plant requiring the nutrient to build the enzyme to make that chemical is the same. So it's the same, managing plant nutrition is the same if we are trying to optimize production and it's the same if we are trying to optimize immunity and plant health. They are one and the same thing. Now there's some subtleties here which we're going to go through the examples but in principle um, it's much uh, the same thing. So let's move on and talk about the plant's uh, defense systems. We have two lines of defense, physical defenses and then more internal systemic biochemical defenses. And the physical defenses are, as, it's, as it says on the tin, we're talking about the thickness of the skin of the plant, how strong that cuticle and how well reinforced that those uh, external layers are, how strong the cell walls are, how tough and rigid and robust and reinforced that physical barrier on the plant is. And that's all sorts of various compounds um, that help thicken up that skin of the plant. We're going to talk about those. So that's our physical defense. That's our first line of defense. But then internally, we also have these systemic, more not structural barriers, but these metabolic compounds, these internal defenses, system, systemic chemicals and things, biochemicals, the defense chemicals there that I mentioned earlier. So these are then internal. And these are the ones that I also just alluded to earlier in the part one here, here where I was talking about that um, in order for the plant to really optimize the production of these internal defense chemicals, the plant is reliant on the soil biome. When it is under attack, as you can see here from a pathogen, as I talked this about earlier, pathogen or the insect, that induces changes in root behavior. The plant will release specific root exudates that will be a call for help, a cry for help to recruit the organisms from the soil who can then very uniquely and specifically help that plant 
turn on the production of very specific defense chemicals. So first there is the attack, then there's the call for help, then we recruit the organisms as you can see here, and then those organisms help the plant synthesize these specialized metabolic compounds, defense chemicals, which systemically then are redistributed uh, throughout the plant um, <coughs> and help to then block the site of infection or again be distasteful to the insect, upset the digestion, these, these types of things. Okay, so that's the, that's the process. So when we talk about the biochemical processes, again, this is why we also have to be careful about separating some of our strategies. Um, the plant can't do this without that soil biome and that's why the, the conversation we just had just previously about the role and the contribution of the biological aspect to this is interlinked with the nutritional link because the plant can't do this without the help of those organisms. It then needs the nutrients to build the defense chemical, but it's the microbe that gives the signal or the priming of that. So they are, we sh must be careful about um, separating those. Um, they are somewhat one and the same, which is the point about integrated pest disease management. It's about using those many and varied tools um, all together. And I won't dwell on this slide, it's just to say that we have, again, a lot of really good and emerging new and recent kind of science and understanding of trying to untangle some of these mechanisms of how plants feel this immune response and changes that occur in plant metabolism or at a, even at a genetic or epigenetic level um, and how we're just beginning to unpack these various mechanisms that which by which the plant can fuel um, these immune system. And there's a whole range of things here that I, I'm not going to necessarily go into, um, but of course some of them are very interesting like this discussion around epigenetics where we don't actually change the genetic makeup of the plant but just the activity or the expression of those genes and this is all triggered from various you know, environmental cues and this is why we can use things like nutrition or biological organisms to help prime um, some of these kind of changes. So we have these various um, um, beginnings of these under mechanistic kind of understandings of how some of this all works and ultimately this leads to an overall improved stress and, and pest management etc. So there's there's an element here also of memory. Uh, some plant, it's it's like this point about frost protection. Um, you'd all be aware of this. If a if a plant has exposure to mild cooling temperatures, as the temperature is getting cooler and cooler, if it has mild exposure, that's like a muscle. It's priming itself to that cooler weather, so that if we have a bigger drop, a bigger drop in temperature, then the plant is able to handle that as compared to a plant that has not had that mild exposure to frost. If we put it out and it, 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 it um, is exposed to a, a large frost, then it you know, can die or it can really uh, suffer much more so. So the point here is just that sometimes that mild exposure can actually build up certain stress tolerances and yes, the plant seems to have memory of that um, at some level. And these are some of those mechanisms by which it has this memory. So here I'm just putting a splash of studies and papers that are out there that all demonstrate this link between nutrition and disease or insect pests, nutrition and plant immunity. There is actually lots of studies that highlight the link that when we have plant deficiencies that this undermines the plant health, the plant's ability to fuel these various immune processes, physical or biochemical processes that we talk about, um, and that therefore disease or insect pressure will be the result. There is good evidence of the links between nutrition, plant health and pest and disease resistance. And in some circles, some, we think this is kind of more of a fringe idea. It's like, oh yeah, I don't know, these nutrients, they're not really that effective at actually controlling things or helping the plant control itself, helping the plant fuel itself. We have kind of mixed views on this. But just so you know, if you really dive into the literature, there's a lot of studies that would support this idea. Where I will acknowledge where we do have definite weakness is the practical application, is translating some of the science, like often, translating some of the science into the applied context, to the practical setting in real world farming, for example. I acknowledge absolutely this is where we have more of a barrier and a stumbling block. But if we really dive into the links between nutrition and disease, I would argue there's quite a robust body of literature there to support this idea. 
Um, this is one such book, if anyone's interested, Mineral uh, Nutrition and Plant Disease. It's really summarized down hundreds of other studies and it just breaks it down into lots of tables. If you look up the crop of interest and then look at the different nutrients, it will give you a nice table of the various diseases that have been linked to a, a, either a deficiency or an excess supply of that nutrient. So this is a quite an expensive book, unfortunately, but um, it is quite comprehensive in terms of cataloging in a nice, I mean, it can be a bit dense reading as well, but it's also a nice tabular form of just various nutrients, diseases, and their links for various crops. So I'd recommend this one if anyone's um, interested. And here's then an example uh, from the literature on this point about the practical application that I see is perhaps more the challenge. This is an example looking at um, manganese on cucumbers. And um, I'll just read you this quote here. Uh, foliar application of manganese is an effective factor in enhancing plant resistance to fungal diseases, but the efficiency of this method uh, strongly depends on the application time. So they're saying good levels of manganese in the plants, in the cucumbers, led to a significant reduction in fungal disease. The highest reduction in disease severity was observed when manganese solutions were applied at four days before infection. The cucumber plants treated by manganese at four days before infection accumulated the highest level of manganese in their leaves than those treated at 14, 10 or 7 days before infection. So here they're pointing out that the most recent application of manganese boosted leaf manganese the best so that when the infection came along, the plant was able to tolerate that infection because that manganese was at a high level, at an adequate level, to therefore provide protective benefits. If we applied that manganese much earlier, um, the manganese was not still at high enough levels to then confer resistance. And, and so I think this captures the essence of the problem, is that, well, how do I know when I'm going to get infected? Uh, how, how do I know how many days before that infection that I have to apply and which nutrient? Okay, like, so we have these links, we have evidence that shows there's all these links, but how do we practically make that work? And again, I acknowledge that this is uh, one of the real challenges. And of course, so if, you know, if two farmers, two cucumber farm neighbors were playing around with this crazy idea that nutrients can manage disease, and one of them happens to apply that manganese four days before they get an infection, the other one did it two weeks earlier, you know, one of them is going to walk away from that experience and say, well, this idea of nutrients managing disease is a load of BS. Uh, and the other one's going to say, wow, there was really something there. And so, y it, you know, it's a really, I think, a really good example of highlighting just some of the practical challenges that we face. I don't think it's the, the evidence that nutrients can help here. It's the practical application um, of this. And I'm encouraged we have some fascinating things happening in the world of all sciences, um, especially the stuff that I'm interested in, like plants and soils that um, I spend reading. Um, like this fascinating example, we have some amazing technology these days where we can also begin to visualize nutrients in plants with specialized cameras and microscopes and technology. And that's what you're seeing here. This is just an example on sunflowers with zinc. And uh, just, a, just a small example for interest's sake here. Um, what you're looking at here is this is a transect of the sunflower leaf. And um, here's the cold colors is low concentration through to the warmer colors, brighter colors, which is a high concentration of that zinc. And if you look at this transect, you can see they applied some zinc here. 15 minutes later, it's still looking quite blue. 30 minutes later, we're starting to see a few little red spots emerge there where zinc seems to be accumulating. By the time we hit one hour, we've got these distinct hot zones where zinc is really getting, uh, incre levels of zinc are really increasing where the zinc is being absorbed into the leaf. And then you can see then the red here starts to permeate out from those hot spots there. Um, we can see then the red is starting to kind of translocate. The zinc is moving around through the rest of that leaf. And what they're demonstrating here is, is that um, that it was these little trichomes, these fine hairs on the leaf surface here that were hot spots of that zinc being absorbed. It turns out that the cells at the bottom of that hair, that trichome, are highly permeable. And so they were the entry point where zinc is 
enters the leaf and then um, we can see it then translocating throughout the rest of the leaf. And similarly here you can see we're comparing a zinc sulfate to a zinc oxide, um, just putting the four dots onto the leaf and you can see that clearly over here the zinc sulfate is working much better at being absorbed and increasing the zinc concentration as compared to the zinc oxide which is still very cold in colour. I share this purely for interest sake to highlight that I think that we have some wonderful emerging technologies that are enabling us. I could show other fascinating photos of nutrients uh, deposition in different parts of the plant, old leaves, young leaves, stems, etc., etc., where we can really begin to visualize where the nutrients are going, how they are being absorbed and utilized. And I hope that some of these types of applications will also help us with overcoming some of those practical challenges like the manganese example there to try and help us better um, manage um, disease etc pests and disease okay so let's hit some of the studies on and different nutrients and how they work and how they function how they can kind of help um, overall plant um, health so here's a, a good just kind of summary one to kind of get started the role of nutrients in controlling diseases for sustainable agriculture a review and here they suggest that the control of plant diseases using classical pesticides, of course, is a growing concern. We are, due to consumer um, awareness, due to environmental concerns, we're looking for alternatives and nutrients may be one piece of that puzzle in an integrated approach. And so they show here that when nitrogen is high, um, there is an increased uh, severity, of e severity of infection. Potassium can also decrease the severity of that infection. Manganese, as we mentioned, can control a number of diseases, has an important role in lignin biosynthesis, so it's toughening up the skin of the plant. Um, some of these um, biochemicals and helping to drive photosynthetic activity. Boron also found to reduce the disease severity of many diseases because of the function that boron has in cell wall structure. So I'll talk about this in a few, few minutes, um, reinforcing the cell walls of the plant. And silicon, also shown to control a number of diseases, as silicon also creates a stronger physical barrier, restricting the fungal hyphal penetration, as well as inducing the production of some of these antifungal metabolic internal systemic compounds. Okay, so there's just a kind of a smattering of examples. Here's another more recent review, plant mineral nutrition and disease, um, linking these for uh, plant sustainable crop production. And so here we have a, a review paper that's really just looking at a whole host of other studies and summarizing their findings. Um, they didn't necessarily do an experiment, so to speak here, they're just reviewing some of the other literature that has done some of those various experiments, highlighting that some of the macronutrients, for example, can all, I know you probably can't read this, but um, they all help with various kind of mechanisms in terms of encouraging the production of these defense chemicals or upregulating certain genes that um, uh, code for those or reinforcing the cell walls, the structural barriers, um, these types of things. And I'll cherry pick an example here because I know you won't be able to read this of course, um, but let's have a look at just some kind of examples. Um, nitrogen on wheat, say stripe rust, where the nitrogen supply can decrease uh, the severity there, just for example. Um, potassium on wheat uh, for leaf blight, increased potassium can also <coughs> reduce disease severity, uh, again for example. Calcium on crucifers if against uh, club root rot, um, su supplying calcium can also help to lower the severity of um, club root, for example. Um, sulfur also on all seed rape um, for leaf spot, also helping. So I'm just I know you probably can't read those, but I'm just trying to share some examples with you that highlights that each of these is separate kind of references and studies that are highlighting that, um, yes, better nutrient supply of some of those macronutrients can also really help. Similarly with our micronutrients, there's also, we have various mechanisms um, in relation to this. Zinc is a good one um, that helps to, when the plant is under attack from pest or disease, it starts to release a lot of something called reactive oxygen species or stress related compounds, kind of like oxidants. Um, when we talk about we like to eat food rich in antioxidants, those antioxidants quenches the oxidants in our body. So when the plant is under attack, it starts to produce a lot of these harmful chemicals and zinc is very good at scavenging those like the reason we all eat blueberries is for these antioxidants. Zinc is a very good scavenger of some of those um, 
reactive kind of compounds, stress-related compounds, for example. I talked about iron already. Many pathogens have a, a also a high requirement for iron, so we can um, induce a deficiency in the pathogen through the production of those special compounds called siderophores. Um, silicon and boron, they're both really important for cell wall strength. I'm going to share examples of these. Manganese we've touched on also already, as well as copper. They're also both very important for the synthesis of lignin, so structural barrier. And manganese is also very important for um, some of these internal defense chemicals as well. Again, just a smattering of examples here. Boron on, again, on crucifers. Again, club root disease here. So boron and calcium very closely linked. They work together. Um, and so they also found that boron reduces the disease um, severity. Uh, zinc and wheat on fusarium, uh, zinc application reducing the disease infection, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to go through all of those. I'm just trying to give you a tiny few examples of, to point out that there is lots of stuff in the literature if, for those that really want to go and dig it up. And it's not just a theoretical idea, um, a fringe idea that nutrients can really help here. They can be a valuable part of an integrated approach. Am I going to say that just plant nutrition can help con completely control pest and disease? No, but can it make a contribution? Absolutely yes. And so part of that integrated approach is what we should be having. Okay, so to summarize some of these, I'm going to go, we're going to untangle a couple more specifics under these, but in terms of cell strength, um, calcium, silicon, and boron, these three are all really important at reinforcing the plant's cell walls, making it impenetrable to insects or to disease. Uh, same with manganese, <coughs> copper, and then also boron. They're really good for those structural compounds like the lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, these types of things. They're all very good to reinforce. Um, silicon and manganese, both good for the internal uh, biochemicals, defense chemicals. And then we're going to talk uh, a little bit at length on nitrogen and just talk about how excess nitrogen can also undermine plant health. We, we often have a tendency to over-apply our nitrogen. Of course, nitrogen is good for production. It helps to boost yield, but that can come with an undermining of plant health. Uh, and I will talk about the mechanisms underneath that. Okay, so calcium, um, I touched on this already. It has, it's, a, it's also a nutrient that has a two-part mechanism. Um, one is, is calcium is deposited in those cell walls, so it kind of really helps to toughen up the cell walls and that skin of the plant. And traditionally, if we look at the literature, that's heavily focused on calcium's role in uh, boosting the physical barrier. But we now know that it is also an important signaling molecule or a messenger. So it has a very important role in sending a signal to other parts of the plant to turn on the production of those defense chemicals that can then rush to the site of infection. So calcium is also both a, has a direct role in cell strength, but also has a more indirect role through um, boosting the plant's ability to communicate to other parts to help send the defense chemicals to help. Same with boron. Boron's really mainly a structural thing. It works tightly with calcium. They embed together um, to reinforce the cell walls. So boron and calcium are best friends. They are synergists together. They work uh, a lot together. So boron helps calcium enter the plant. Boron helps calcium become available. So they kind of go hand in glove um, in that regard. So they work um, simultaneously together. And the third kind of partner in that trio is silicon. Now, silicon technically is not an essential nutrient. The plants can fulfill their life cycles without it, um, but it is a very beneficial nutrient. And there's many, many studies highlighting that plants that are enriched with silicon, that have more silicon in them, are, um, have greater pest and disease resistance. And that's because silicon has two modes of action, again, physical, but also underlying um, biochemical. But the interesting thing about silicon is that it also helps with all sorts of other things beyond pest and disease management, which is not the topic for today, um, but it has also been shown to improve the plant's tolerance to things like salinity and sodicity, things like heavy metals, things like drought conditions or waterlogged conditions, uh, cold stress, heat stress, almost any environmental stress you can name there will be some evidence that shows that silicon helps the plant tolerate those 
environmental stresses also very well. And this may be important for if we do have more of these dry summers, like a lot of Europe seems to be having in the last recent years, um, thing, anything that can help the plant tolerance to those um, dry conditions, hot dry conditions would be very beneficial. And on top of that, we also see pest and disease resistance um, coming through uh, sil with silicon rich plants as well. And as I mentioned, that's uh, again, is the part of cell wall reinforcement along with calcium and boron, um, but also signaling, uh, but also silicon helps with the production of some particular very specific um, antimicrobial compounds. So just a kind of visual cue to what I'm kind of talking about here. When we reinforce the cells and we make the skin of the plant thicker or tougher or more tightly bound, it just makes it harder for the microorganism for example, the fungal hyphae in this example too, to penetrate through. It doesn't have the strength to penetrate through that reinforced, robust cell walls. It can't get through. And there's also some amazing, um, up really up close scanning electron micrograph photos of insects that are chewing on silicon rich plants. And they actually show that the, the mandibles of the insect are more wo uh, worn down because it's harder for the insects to chew through that tough silicon layer and that it actually will um, degrade or wear down their, their mandibles. There's some fascinating um, pictures of this online too. Now, beyond this, um, silicon is a, um, a, hev <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> a heavily researched nutrient. There's lots and lots of papers on this, and it seems to have all sorts of various different mechanisms. Another one is through these volatile organic compounds that I mentioned also in the previous talk. So um, helping the plant to release smells and scents, these volatile compounds, some of which can attract in predators um, or some of which can be more directly antagonistic um, to the, the pest in action. So silicon not only helps with those um, parts of the plant reinforcing the structural and, and defense chemicals internally, but even releasing some of these various chemicals um, to make the um, plant more uh, less attractive to insects or to call in the um, predatory helpers. Okay, and this is um, a, a nice image here that kind of summarizes that then it does depend a bit on the different insect pests. So, cal uh, so silicon, sorry, can um, be deposited in those cell walls, but it can also be held in other parts of the plant. And what they're showing here is, is that um, if we were to compare chewing or boring insects versus borer insects versus uh, say sap suckers or fluid feeders, um, you can see that when silicon is deposited on, for example, the very external structures of the plant, like in fine leaf hairs or spikes, um, this can have a suppressive effect on the chewers because it's kind of spiky and they can't get in there and kind of can't bite the leaf because of these spiky structure, silicon rich structures. But that does not stop, for example, a phloem feeder who can just kind of pierce through that and still um, cause problems. Um, then we have silicon here that is also deposited um, just within the cells, so not in the cell walls, but just generally silicon-rich cells. And again, that seems to be suppressive of the borers, but not um, the sap suckers. It's only when we really get that silicon embedded into the cell walls where we then start to see dual suppression of also our um, sap suckers. And the key to getting silicon in the cell walls is also it working in partnership with boron particularly and calcium. Again, the three of them all kind of work together to support this process, especially boron there. So that's just uh, some examples there of um, that the, the mode of action or the benefit of nutrient can then be dependent on what insect we're talking about. And so this is from that same piece of work. This is a, again a uh, a review, a meta-analysis, so we're kind of summarizing lots of other studies and looking for the overall trends and patterns. So you can see that as we move to the left of this line, that means we are seeing a suppression of the insect pest. So overall, um, herbivore pests, as you can see, do decline with silicon-rich plants. And it's particularly, again, the chewers and the bor uh, borers that are um, more, uh, they seem to dislike silicon-rich plants the most. But still, even the fluid feeders, even though it was a smaller reduction, it was still an overall a reduction in the fluid feeding insect pests um, as well. So the subtlety here is, or the, I think the important, one of the important oversights that we have also in plant breeding is that the benefit or the um, ability of different 
varieties to scavenge different nutrients. And this is a really neat example of this. This is wheat plants, different varieties of wheat, but they're all growing in just a hydroponic solution. So this is not an in-field, this is just a lab study, but they are all growing in the exact same nutrient solution. Exact same nutrient solution, just different varieties. And then we're measuring the silicon accumulation of those different varieties. So we're ju I'm just pointing out here that some varieties have either a better or worse ability to uptake, in this example, silicon and make use of that silicon. And so there's a big difference here. Look at this variety, it's all the way down here, and yet this one is all the way up here, for example. So in this discussion about trying to integrate pest and disease management, also the variety, the cultivar, the genetics, is also important because some may be better suited for a lower input or a, a lower pesticide, an integrated strategy than others. And again, of course, we have lots of um, black spot, uh, blind spots here. We have knowledge gaps in this department, but I'm just pointing out that um, I think the discussions around varieties and therefore that discussion we had earlier about variety blends could also help to kind of maybe offset or compensate um, for uh, some, of this, um, some of this nuance here. Okay, so let's move on to, that was a lot about silicon, let's move on to um, nitrogen. And nitrogen is a big one. I'm going to do a bit of a detailed discussion on nitrogen also, um, and then we're going to round it off talking about a few of the other nutrients. Now, nitrogen is also uh, <coughs> a, a really important one, both in terms of its effect on the physical and biochemical defences. And firstly, on the physical defences, uh, on the physical defences, it's right here. It's that the, the thickness of the cuticle or particularly the production of lignin. We have lots of studies that show that plants high in nitrogen, and you all know this, if the, if the plant is too high in nitrogen, it gets a bit tall or a bit leggy, a bit thin, it's a bit more prone to lodging or falling over. And that's because nitrogen has a suppressive effect on lignin production. And it's lignin, which is the structural part of the plant that keeps it strong and rigid. Um, plants that are low in lignin are going to be more weak and spindly. So nitrogen suppresses lignin synthesis and lignin is one of those structural compounds that will give you a physical barrier that it's harder for insects and disease to, to get through, to pass through. So this is one of the big um, uh, points about nitrogen that we have to be also careful about. Uh, nitrogen also suppresses this particular group of defense chemicals called phytoalexins. Um, they're a very important group that um, all plants produce, and we know that nitrogen seems to suppress those. And then I'm going to talk about this now in more detail. Um, then the plant has the ability to produce a range of different um, defense chemicals, which are proteins. And so nitrogen can enhance those production of some of those nitrogen bearing defense chemicals, but it can also suppress other groups of defense chemicals um, that do not um, contain nitrogen. So, and I'm going to come back to that point and, and just say a few things here. So on this point about nitrogen, I think the key point that I just want to really make sure everyone's clear on is that um, plants make use of all can make use of all sorts of different forms of nitrogen. And classically, when we think about plant nutrition, we always hear about that nitrate and ammonium are the two dominant forms. And if we type in the nitrogen cycle to Google images, you'll come up with hundreds of nitrogen cycle images showing nitrogen moving up in the air, through plants, through soils, through water, all over the place. And all of those images will have two forms of nitrogen that enters the plant, nitrate and ammonium. And it's not that that is false, but it's just that it is a small part of the story. Plants also can make use of lots of other forms of nitrogen, including urea. Urea can be taken up as urea, but also including all of these other larger, more organic molecules like amino acids. This is organic nitrogen. Peptides are little chains of amino acids, and proteins are bigger chains of amino acids. So these organic fractions of nitrogen can all be taken up by the plant. And they come from organic cycling of organic material, organic matter, soil organic matter. They come from organic manures, organic compost, any organic amendments. You will have some of these amino acids, peptides, and proteins, these organic fractions of nitrogen that can be directly taken up. And it turns out that they are very favorable forms of nitrogen to give the plant for quality, for efficiency, and for plant health and immunity. So that's the other part. And then even bacteria. 
who are even larger again. Bacteria can also be engulfed, internalized through the root tips where the plant can also digest those bacteria and strip nutrients out of them. Some of you may have come across this discussion about the rhizophagy cycle. Um, so the point here is just to say that it's not just these small inorganic fractions that happen to be the dominant forms in our fertilizer nitrogen um, that we seem to dominate our thinking in that direction because that's what many of our fertilizers are. Um, just to say that the plants can make use of these larger organic forms of nitrogen, these more complex forms, and even larger whole organisms can even be engulfed. And I would argue that a plant that is efficient and, and utilizing nitrogen resources from the soil should be a plant that can make use of all of those, not just the inorganic fractions, but also all of them. And so this opens up that discussion also about plant breeding and varieties. We have bred varieties that seem to be very good at accumulating the nitrate and ammonium and may not be so good at accumulating some of the organic fractions. If we look at some of the studies of the, from nature, from the ecological literature, it seems to be those plants are much more better adapt at using some of these organic fractions um, because for the simple reason that those organic fractions are more prevalent in those environments. You don't see as much inorganic fractions in those environments as you do in agricultural environments where we are applying r those inorganic fractions, therefore thereby selecting plants that can make use of those. So there's a, a subtlety there. And the point then about plant health or efficiency of these nitrogen forms is that when the plant takes up any of these forms of nitrogen, be that inorganic, be that organic, ultimately it is going to shuttle and make use of those forms along this metabolic pathway. So it doesn't matter uh, if the plant takes up nitrates, ultimately it's going to move those nitrates along this pathway to get to proteins. The plant wants proteins, it wants organic fractions. If, we, if the plant takes up urea, it's going to make use of that urea and convert it onwards to proteins. If the plant takes up ammonium, it's going to convert it onwards to proteins. The plant really wants organic fractions. These are the fractions that are more functional, they're useful, there's a lot of functions for amino acids and these proteins. When I say proteins, I'm not talking about the structural proteins like, like we would say we we're trying to build proteins like build protein for milling wheat spec or build protein for improving animal feed or quality of the feed. I'm not talking about those structural proteins. I'm also talking about some of the internal or metabolic proteins. And there are all sorts of different proteins that all serve all sorts of functions in plant growth and development, particularly, for example, around some of these having um, being defense chemicals, okay? So helping against pests and disease. So the point here then is just to say that when the plant takes up nitrogen, it has to use these nutrients that are in the red box. These are the nutrients that form the enzymes that catalyze the process, like we were talking about with photosynthesis earlier. These are the nutrients that will help to build the enzyme to catalyze nitrate moving along. So we need moly, sulfur, and iron for this process. Nickel is part of a special enzyme called urease that helps the plant use the urea and turn it into ammonium. And then the plant needs manganese and magnesium to turn that ammonium into the amino acid, into organic forms. And then it needs all sorts of nutrients to stitch those amino acids together to build these larger complex proteins. So the point here is just to say that along each step of this chain, that involves energy, effort. The plant makes use of the nitrogen, has to turn it into something else. Then it has to turn it into something else. And all of these steps along this metabolic pathway, therefore, involve energy and involve nutrients, like you can see um, the nutrients um, listed in the red boxes here. So if we want to be efficient, if we want to optimize plant health and therefore save the plant's health, help, help, let it be efficient at using nitrogen and therefore save energy for other growth processes. The point here is this is called something, metabo something called metabolic shortcutting. And the point here is, is that when, we, when the plant takes up those inorganic forms, it doesn't really want them. It wants them as building blocks, but it wants to turn them into the aminos, into the peptides, into the proteins. So when we feed the plant nitrate or ammonium, you know, these other ones back here, for example, the plant will expend energy to add, when I say inorganic versus nitrogen versus organic nitrogen, all I'm just saying is inorganic does not have carbon in it. Organic forms of nitrogen do have carbon embedded in there. And so all I'm seeing is here is, is that when we turn inorganic nitrogen into organic nitrogen, into amino acids, 
This step here requires energy. And then when the plant builds peptides, this step here also requires energy. And when we build proteins, this step here requires energy. And the point here is to say that if the plant is always turning inorganic nitrogen into organic nitrogen, and each step of that way is costing us energy, what would happen if we just fed the plant organic forms of nitrogen, which are further up the metabolic pathway, which ultimately save the plant's energy on processing those lower forms, the inorganic forms, we don't have to expend all that energy, energy anymore. We're just delivering the nitrogen in the form that the plant ultimately wants to turn it to anyway. So there's some interesting work looking at applying amino acids directly to plants, applying protein hydrolysates directly to plants. And these forms of nitrogen, because they're already in the right form, the plant is saving energy. And it doesn't have to expend energy on the nitrate processing or the ammonium processing. And when we save energy, we can use that energy elsewhere. We can grow more roots, we can fill more seed. Because the carbon that's building these organic fractions here, when I say this is inorganic, it has no carbon, these are organic, they have carbon, that carbon comes from photosynthesis. So we are stealing photosynthetic carbon to build these organic molecules. If we just deliver them as organic molecules, we then save photosynthetic carbon. So that photosynthetic carbon can be used elsewhere to grow more roots, to tiller more, to produce defense chemicals, to optimize other processes in the plant. So this is why these organic forms are actually more efficient. And therefore, I'm not saying we can apply solely these organic forms, but the more we can make use of them, use, make use of them alongside with some of our traditional fertilizers, there are efficiency gains uh, to be had. And this also, I give you all of this preamble to tell you that this also has relevance for plant health and pest and disease resistance. And this is a very a wonderful study, also a review paper, sorry, uh, also out of the UK here um, from some researchers up in Edinburgh, um, which uh, is open access. I would encourage you to have a read of this if some of you are interested. When medicine feeds the problem, do nitrogen fertilizers and pesticides enhance the nutritional quality of crops for their pests and disease. So here they review the evidence that suggests that when we over apply nitrogen, that nitrogen rich plants that have too much nitrogen in them become more attractive to pests and disease. That we are undermining plant health because of this enrichment of nitrogen. And there's a couple of ways in which this is important, but the, the crux of the point here um, that they really summarize is that um, plant, uh, insects and disease, they all have a demand, just like we do and plants do and animals do, same with insects, same as microorganisms, same with all living organisms, they all have a demand for amino acids. They want, because the amino acids are the building blocks to help them build proteins. So we want amino acids to then stitch them together to build human-related proteins, things that humans need. Uh, animals like to use amino acids to stitch them together to build livestock things. And plants like to use amino acids to help them build plant proteins, things that they need. Microbes like amino acids to help them build proteins that microbes need. Insects like amino acids to help them build things that insects need. So we are all competing for amino acids, the building blocks of our various proteins. This is the point. So that means if we over apply nitrogen and what the study is suggesting, this review is suggesting, is that that can induce an accumulation, a buildup of amino acids, which then makes the plant more attractive to the insect pest. This is their argument, if we have too much nitrogen. There's a subtlety here. I would argue that it's not just that it's too much nitrogen, it is too much nitrogen in relation to these other synergistic nutrients that help convert that into more complex proteins. Because the point here is that insects, they cannot digest more complete and complex plant proteins. Insects want the building blocks, the amino acids. If the plant has sufficient phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, etc., to then turn those amino acids into plant proteins that are structurally larger, more complex, the insects find that harder to digest. They want the aminos. So it's not just an enrichment of nitrogen, it is an enrichment of nitrogen in relation to these other important nutrients that then 
help finish the process of protein synthesis and finish that conversion. So their argument is that excess nitrogen leads to an accumulation of amino acids, thereby making the plant more attractive. But I would argue it's excess nitrogen in relation to those extra nutrients. Now, the other part to this discussion is the effect of pesticides on also this process, where they also, again, this same paper here, lays out the evidence suggesting that pesticides also undermine these protein-related processes, thereby making the plant more attractive to pests. And the mechanism here is that when the plant um, is exposed to a pesticide, um, it's not going to kill it if we apply a fungicide to a plant. It's not necessarily going to kill the plant. If we apply a selective herbicide to the plant, it's not necessarily going to kill the plant. It's going to kill the other target or organism. But the plants are not necessarily going to love that. They don't necessarily like being absorbing that particular chemical, so they will detoxify it. They will mobilize specific detoxification proteins that will then play a function in breaking apart that pesticide and detoxifying it. And you've all seen this before, after you've applied certain pesticides, where the plant might look a little bit stressed for a day or two, it kind of looks a bit unhappy, and then it pulls through. That's just the stress response to being exposed to that chemical. It's mobilizing its detoxification pathway, then it breaks down the chemical, then it moves on with its life. And so they suggest here that when we apply pesticides, which are of course designed to control the pest, insect, or disease, that the stress response at an underlying metabolic level inside the plant, that that induces a process of protein breakdown, or protein, it's called protein catabolism, protein breakdown, that the plant will actually take other proteins that it now no longer is the priority, it will break them down back into, maybe this slide here is better, it will break them down back into the building blocks so that it can resynthesize the detoxification proteins. So it's breaking down the current reserves so it can rebuild detoxification proteins, which it needs more importantly right now because it's trying to get rid of the chemical that it doesn't necessarily want. It's not going to kill it, but it doesn't necessarily want it there either. So this stress response of the pesticide application induces this, again, spike in free amino acids, which is what the insects and disease are more attracted to. Now, that may be a short-term blip because then the plant will produce the complex material or the detox material to get rid of it, but it can induce these subtle changes at a metabolic level. We may not visually see these um, that are ultimately undermining plant health. And of course, then in the point of pesticides, um, on top of these underlying metabolic changes in plant development, of course, we're also knocking out some of our potential beneficial insects, beneficial enemies, who are also going to play a role here. So that's the essence of their discussion um, in which they suggest here that um, nitrogen mismanagement and pesticide applications may be at an underlying metabolic level inducing these changes in plant status, nutrient status that makes them more attractive ultimately to the pest and disease. Okay, now there's a subtlety uh, here. Um, we can move on, uh, I think, from the nitrogen discussion after here, but just this last point. Um, there's a subtlety here is that it does, again, depend on the insect pest. So when we enrich the plant with nitrogen, that does increase the production of certain nitrogen-bearing defense chemicals. And if the insect pest is susceptible to that chemical, then actually applying nitrogen can increase the level of control. We can increase the production of the defense chemical, the nitrogen-bearing defense control, the chemical, and thereby achieve better pest resistance, uh, plant um, resistance. However, um, if that excess, that at the same time, that excess nitrogen can also then suppress or decrease different sets of defense chemicals or the carbon-bearing defense chemicals. And if our insect pest is susceptible to the carbon-bearing defense chemical, well, that's where high nitrogen can actually undermine plant health. So it just it's a subtlety there. I don't want you to take away that somehow that all nitrogen is bad. It's not. It's about being in the right optimum zone. If we over-apply, you can induce these changes um, at a metabolic level, but sometimes that could be beneficial if it's producing a nitrogen-bearing defense chemical, which is the one needed to control that pest. So it can have a positive impact, but it can also have a 
negative impact. So there's just there's a little bit of um, subtlety there. Um, if anyone's interested, I will do a very quick shameless plug before we move on to the final nutrients. Um, that little um, montage you just heard there all about nitrogen has come from a very recent uh, online course that I've run called Folia Nitrogen, where I untangle this in a whole lot more detail and talk about the opportunity to use foliar applications of nitrogen to improve nutrient use efficiencies um, and optimize plant health. Um, so that is now an on-demand course that is available and or I will still be here in the UK for a few more weeks. I have three events where we're doing some practical field days on this on host farms um, who are going to demonstrate their, their, some of their foliar nitrogen related strategies. So um, 5th of July uh, here in um, near Birmingham, uh, 11th of July in South Wales and 13th of July down in Cornwall. So if anyone is around and wants to hear a discussion and a field walk, just go see a case study farmer who's applying some of these strategies, um, you'll find more information on my website. Okay, let's move on. Sulfur is the other one that works with nitrogen for that reason that we talked about just then, that amino acids turning into proteins, this whole discussion about protein synthesis, Sulfur is also part of the, some of the amino acids. There are two very important amino acids that are sulfur bearing. You may have come across them, cysteine and methionine. And so it turns out that some defense chemicals are also need sulfur or sulfur bearing amino acids to then build some of those sulfur related proteins. And so sulfur is also a very important one a important nutrient to optimize generally nitrogen management and therefore w the discussion we just had but also um, sulfur is also involved in the synthesis of some other very unique and specific sulfur bearing um, defense ke uh, chemicals um, that can also help to um, suppress uh, pests or um, optimize um, plant health so sulfur is an important nutrient it works in tandem um, with nitrogen Many of you may be familiar with the idea of applying sulfur as a, as a fungicide, like wettable sulfur, elemental sulfur as a fungicide. It does have direct suppressive effects, antifungal effects, but it also then as an essential nutrient helps to optimize the production of these sulfur bearing amino acids and therefore some of these sulfur bearing defense chemicals. So sulfur is also a, a very important one that particularly works closely with um, nitrogen here. Potassium also has some links in this discussion. Um, I talked about earlier that slide of photosynthesis. We talked about primary photosynthesis to get that sugar molecule, the simple sugar molecule that we then stitch that together to build the larger, more complex carbohydrates. And that's what potassium is really important for. So when we have optimized potassium in the plant, that increases the production of these larger, more complex molecules. That high molecular weight compounds. Um, potassium helps to increase those. So these are the more complex things like proteins, starches and cellulose. Um, whereas when we have potassium deficiency, we get a backlog of all of the smaller building blocks like the simple sugars, um, the aminos, etc. So potassium has this role in building the complex stuff. And if we don't have enough potassium, that means we have a backlog of the simple stuff and it's the simple stuff that the insects and the disease are more attracted to. They can't digest the complex stuff, it's too complex. They can digest these smaller building blocks. And so they are more attracted to plants that have more of those smaller building blocks. So a potassium deficient plant also um, can undermine this process. Uh, I talked about this already, manganese and copper, they both play a very important direct role in this lignin synthesis. This is what helps the structure of the plant to prevent lodging, but it's also the same chemical that then, a compound, sorry, that is um, part of that skin of the plant, making it um, more um, difficult for um, pathogens and, and insects to chew through. It's a complex molecule, um, thereby the more lignin or lignified plants um, that we have there, it's um, enhancing the structural barrier, the structural resistance um, against insect pests. And then um, lastly, zinc is the other one. Um, zinc is an interesting one that plants, um, when we optimize zinc status in the plant, the amount of zinc that's in the plant is too toxic for the insects to eat. So this is what the study is pointing out that the um, a pathogen here, sorry, um, it, it has a lower optimum level, a lower ideal level of zinc than plants do. 
So when we optimize the plant zinc status, that's actually too high a status that it can actually induce a toxicity on, uh, on the pathogen there, that it cannot actually eat the plant because the zinc becomes, zinc is of course is a heavy metal, and it becomes a bit too toxic for the pathogen. So this is just a playing into this point about different organisms have different uh, optimum ranges of nutrients that they need, and therefore um, in this example here, optimizing plant zinc status can also um, help us um, against um, our, our pathogens and, and insect pests. Okay, so in summary, part two here, this first point was the exact same point I put on the last summary slide. We must integrate many tools and strategies to manage disease, pests and disease. Some would argue that these discussions we've had today about using nutrition, using biology, those organisms, redesigning the, the farming system with diversity, that all of these strategies are critically important as an integrated strategy so that we don't have such dependency on the pesticide inputs. We all are aware that many, if we overuse our pesticide inputs, that this will accelerate the development of resistance in pathogens and in insect pests. We are all aware of this, and this is the exact reason why we need to be having these other conversations about the potential contribution of nutrition or biology or designing with diversity, even though those control strategies are not perfect and will not give you 100% control, they can be a piece of the puzzle. And that can help you reduce your dependency on the pesticide. And the more you can reduce your dependency on the pesticide, the longer it will be effective for. Because the more you use, the quicker you will accelerate the development of resistance. So these are not, this discussion about using compost extracts or plant nutrients or intercropping, this is not fringe idea for alternative thinking and oh, for some farmers over there that want to play around, tinkering around the edges with that. No, these are important pieces of the puzzle that can make a contribution. And we typically think about pesticides as being much more consistent and much more effective. Um, and that's becoming less and less the case, especially in difficult growing years. I was just in Australia in March, uh, back in March, they've had three very wet years there. And they are finding their fungicides are just not working in those wet years. A lot of their fungicide programs are breaking down. They've had terrible disease pressure. We typically say that, oh, chemicals are much more effective, they're much more consistent. But in unfavorable environmental conditions, this is just not the case anymore. There is a greater need more now than ever to integrate some of these alternative strategies in, um, not because they're woo-woo, but because they are essential to maintaining the longevity of those pesticide inputs that some of us are very dependent on. So that's why we need to have this conversation about plant nutrition, the physical barriers we talked about, calcium, boron, silicon, reinforcing cell walls, plus manganese and copper, reinforcing the lignin that we also discussed there at the end. The biochemical processes, yes, calcium was a signaling molecule, plays a role here. The silicon manganese inducing some of these very specific biochemicals. And then we talked about nitrogen mismanagement there and the role of potassium, um, building more complex materials, sulfur working with nitrogen, um, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I will emphasize there are many applied knowledge gaps. Timings of nutrients, the rates, what rate, what timing, what form of nutrients. I acknowledge there are knowledge gaps here. I do not have perfect answers for you, but this is why we need our research organizations and our, our um, representatives here to be doing this kind of work. There is a strong enough evidence base to support this. I acknowledge you need the local experience, you need the local trials and, ex and research happening here to clarify some of these knowledge gaps, I, I acknowledge. The, pr the best way that I can suggest to practically do this uh, most easily in the farming context is to use plant analysis, leaf analysis, sap analysis, whatever. And it may also has imperfections, it is also not perfect, but at least it is something. Have a plant analysis, ask the plant directly, what is your nutrient status? What nutrients do you have enough of? And don't apply more. What nutrients do you still need or have a deficiency of? And then yes, apply those. 
that plant analysis is the best tool that we have, practically speaking, to try and manage all of these nutrients and the various ways in which we can therefore optimize plant immunity and plant health through correcting any of the deficiencies um, or those imbalances that we identify um, uh, in that analysis. So practically speaking, that's the best suggestion that I can provide. And then I do think that foliar applied nutrients are a very um, effective way to rapidly address those deficiencies. If you have a limitation of a nutrient, you are undermining those various immune processes and defense chemicals, etc., that I outlined. You want to address that deficiency as quickly as possible. You want to have adequate nutrition there to drive the production of that defense chemical. And I think that foliar applications are very effective in this regard, or they can be, but there's a lot of subtlety and nuance to that too but um, they can be the quickest way to correct that deficiency in order to help that plant pull through. Um, so I do think that foliars have um, a very important piece of this discussion. Okay, so we've got to the end. Um, integrated pest and disease management. It is a combination of many different strategies. Today I've tried to just focus in details on three of those. Um, designing with diversity, optimizing the ecological infrastructure, be that in-field or around field margins, etc. This has to be part of that discussion, as we alluded to earlier, start off with the right foot. Then can we improve soil biology? Maybe use of some of these inoculants, this type of thing. Maybe this has a place to play. And equally, then the nutrients that we discussed today. We want to optimize supply of those nutrients, particularly some of the ones of interest that we talked about, calcium, silicon, boron, manganese, etc. some of these particularly. But we want to manage overall plant nutrition. If any nutrient is deficient, you're going to be undermining plant health in some way. Um, in some capacity. So I think trying to up our game, up our knowledge in these three departments, I think can help us. And again, this point about helping us minimize um, our dependency on those pesticide inputs. And some would argue, there is discussion and debate about this, some would argue that integrated pest management is not enough, that the problem with integrated pest management is it still says that pesticides are part of the integrated approach. And that, we're of course, like I outlined, we're trying to use the other pieces of the puzzle to minimize that dependence. But in some circles, people really are very becoming quite critical of IPM, saying that it's more like a greenwashing. It's kind of an excuse to say, well, I can carry on using the pesticide because I'm doing these other things. And so I leave you just with the thought that um, I've tried to lay out an argument as some of these other areas that we need to focus on, um, other strategies that we can focus on, but that there are other conversations to be had. Preventative pest management or holistic pest management are two emerging terms where, where is this greater focus on saying, well, look, of course, we all can agree that our pesticides are tools and that have a time and a place. But we don't want to fall into that trap of just saying, well, I'm going to do a few other things over here and over there so I can continue to use them. We should also, although that's, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm just saying we should also be having the conversation that says, well, how can I not use them at all? And I know that's harder and we're going to go through a transition to get there, but we won't get there if we keep repeating the same, repeating the same. So we also have to have, I think, some of these other more difficult discussions and they don't have to be difficult because there's a lot of farmers and examples and case studies of people out there successfully not using any pesticides at all. So I think it is possible, but of course there's knowledge gaps in that department. I mean, we do not have all the answers, but I think we do need to have this conversation about some of these um, opposing views like preventative pest management or holistic pest management, which still which put much more focus on all of the other strategies um, and try not to keep the pesticides in the picture at whatsoever. Okay, so I think there's room for both, but I think we also need to have some of those other difficult conversations as well. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>
a third of perhaps of my nitrogen requirement in an organic form. Mm. Now, I know it's been through a concrete cow, but is that going <laughs> to help me? Uh, it, it can. So the digester is, is a mixture. So you're right, it does have some organic fractions. And yes, that, I agree with the premise of your point. could be very advantageous. It also is quite... Uh, the nitrogen in there is quite highly available. It's very available and it, it can behave somewhat more similar to synthetic nitrogen in that high availability, that high flush of nitrogen that comes in too much at once that the plant can't make use of as effectively to build the, the proteins, etc. So yet, look, yes, I think it has a place, but I would be mindful it is still pretty soluble stuff, pretty uh, available stuff, and it can be too much at once because I think I know farmers can be guilty of this. A little bit of things can be good, so uh, you know, a little bit more is going to be better. So I would just be mindful about overdoing it still. But yes, I think it's a fair comment. I, I think it can be a piece of the puzzle. And it does contain a mixture of inorganic and organic forms. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, it was just a question about, the, um, about, so about soil testing and its, and its place, really. So I found it really, really interesting looking at uh, the nutrients and, and how they can facilitate better plant health and immunity and I guess my question is um, what's what's more important is it the um, the availability of nutrients uh, in the soil um, be that a lot available through uh, the plant recruiting uh, other organisms within the soil to make it more readily available mm -hmm. or is it a case of uh, in some in some situations um, they're just not being those target nutrients in the soil at all or is that quite a rare phenomenon Okay, yeah, so in, I would say that in a very light and sandy soil, a lighter soil, yes, for sure, there can actually be just not enough nutrients in those soils. And they may be therefore warrant, very warranted to be applying external inputs of fertilizer to try and build that up. In a more heavier clay soil, definitely there's a discussion to be had that they do, those soils do have big reserves of nutrients already present in them. And it may be more important to focus on the biological side to simply unlock and cycle those. Um, but I don't think that's a universal statement. I think in certain soils, there definitely can still be the need to, um, to apply uh, some of that fertility to build it up first, where then you may want to then encourage more of the biological cycling, etc. And of course, that depends on the cropping system and the offtake and the yields that kind of there's got to be a bit of a balance there. Um, but I do think that in a heavier soil that has good soil depth, there is opportunity for that discussion to really minimize uh, fertilizer inputs through better biological cycling, but also through better soil depth, deeper roots to access those nutrients at depth and then cycle those. So I think that that's a conversation we need to have, but I think that's not universal. I think in a really light, sandy soil, you just don't have the body there to do that. You don't have the capacity there to do that. Yeah, so then on that part, yeah, you raise a great question. It, the tricky thing is, is that with soil analysis, I mean, I'm a fan of soil analysis, it has its place. Um, the tricky thing is, is that just because nutrients are present in the soil, it doesn't mean they're available, it doesn't mean they're coming up into the plant, it doesn't mean the plants are taking them up. And that's where some kind of a plant analysis can be very useful because you're going straight to the horse's mouth, asking the plant directly, what is your nutrient status, where are the imbalances, <coughs> Can I correct them? Now, that for some, that might be more of a, a too much of a short-term reactive process, and therefore we might want a longer-term strategy to say, okay, well, if zinc deficiency keeps coming up in my leaf analysis year after year after year, sure, maybe I should go back to the soil and start thinking about how to address that so that I no, don't keep on needing these Band-Aid zinc applications as a foliar, for example. So, so yeah, I, I think the difficulty then with the soil is that we, when we look at the nutrients that are soluble or total, they can be all over the place and not necessarily coming into the plant because of it, antagonisms, interactions with other nutrients, dry soil, nutrient uptake is slowing down. So there are many variables that ultimately influence the uptake and that's where I think the plant analysis can have a real strength. But no, I wouldn't turn my back on a soil analysis. I think soil analysis is still a valuable tool for longer term management. Uh, thank you for your uh, what lecture. It was hugely informative. Um, I'm slightly unsure about amino acids and where they say. From what I heard from you, 
the plant needs them, it's part of it, but they can have too many. And I'm aware if I walk 200 yards that way, there's lots of people trying to sell me amino acids. Can you just clarify a little bit, please? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think uh, they can be very beneficial um, to be applied. And um, that doesn't have to be purchased products. You can also make your own. There are DIY type options to do, for example, make your own um, amino acid digestions or protein hydrolysates, taking fish wastes and um, putting that in a barrel for a year and digesting it, breaking it all down to make your own. So there are opportunities to do these things yourself. Um, to your question earlier about the digestates or taking manures or compost or other organic materials and trying to extract or make use of amino type um, inputs from those waste materials it makes a lot of sense to me. Why not take waste materials and then turn them into a higher value fertilizer? Of course, we should be doing that. So I wouldn't say that it necessarily has to be a purchased product. You do have opportunities to make it yourself. But of course, being honest, I know many farmers won't have the time or inclination and bother to do that. And therefore, maybe those products may have a place to play. Um, but yes, I would argue that I do think external applications of amino acids are valuable. And um, I talk about this in the online course that I mentioned, but particularly a combination of folia, urea with amino acids is a very favorable combination. The two forms of those nitrogen, the organic and then the urea, they work very well through the foliar pathway. The urea is more cost effective per unit of nitrogen. And then to supply a bit of amino acids with that, there is a good synergy that works together. So yeah, I, look, I do think that some of those, I can't comment on any of them or the quality of them or et cetera, but yes, I would argue that there can be benefit to amino acid applications in, in agriculture, in my view, yes. Um, thank you for a very, very informative uh, talk. Um, is there any uh, risk of applying, over applying organic matter? If you're putting a lot of compost on year after year, uh, can it create problems? Is, is it also going to make sure that you know, if it's breaking down, you are getting that balance of nutrition without having to go through the year that you can more or less rely that it's coming through the soil? Mm. Or downsides on straw incorporation to it. Again, can you overdo it? Or um, sure. obviously you can the carbon nitrogen ratio can starve yourself of, of nitrogen temporarily, but if yeah. that's not a problem, um, I have had a problem with paper crumble where I have done that, but mm -hmm. not with straw. Yes. Um, but as long as you get mi well mixed to good good depth to get it, um, you know, uh, spread, um, it, it seems to work. But it, on the other hand, it, it, will it actually provide you with everything you more or less want um, on a micronutrient basis? Mm. Yeah, look, you can, I think most things, anything really, you can overdo. And um, I agree, you could overdo a compost application. Again, depends on the quality of that compost application, but you touched on it there, micronutrients. Some of the micronutrients are heavy metals. If you're applying these in excess, they could start to build up. Some composts do have a level of salts and things in there. So if you're really overdoing it, you could be bringing some saltiness into the system, which is not also favorable. And even though it's an organic form of nitrogen, and let's link that to the lecture here, sure, if you just overdo nitrogen, I think generally, um, even if it's in an organic form, if you're over applying nitrogen in relation to the balance with those other nutrients that it needs to make use of that nitrogen, it can still undermine plant health. So, so yes, I do think you could overdo it. The risk of overdoing um, organic amendments is, um, much, much much lower risk than the risk of overdoing synthetic nutrients, which are just highly soluble and highly available. I think it's generally more of a problem there. But it, yes, I think in theory, you could still overdo an organic amendment. And yeah, yeah, I would. And we have the guidelines here that y you have to work to anyway. You know, whatever it is, 25 odd tons to the hectare generally seems to be a, a considered max. And I think that's, and I think that's, ad and I think that's okay. That's adequate. I wouldn't want to go higher than that anyway. Sure. So the question was, what about in headlands or compacted areas? Could you be going higher um, to try and restore or r repair there? Um, look, I would say, sure. I would say there's probably many uh, specific examples where maybe very high application rates could be warranted in the short term. I, I'm not sure that's something I would be doing in the long term. But yes, if you were trying to kind of really build something a bit quicker in certain areas, fine. I could probably see that as an example, but I wouldn't want to be doing it longer term. Yeah. Uh, thanks again, Joel. Um, just going back to your 
um, a bit about uh, minerals and nutrients and, and having deeper rooted um, species to, to pull them up. Um, would the minerals and nutrients still be available if, if you know if you had an annual crop or a crop in which was deep rooting and, and then you put another crop in afterwards which was about shallower rooting? Would those minerals um, still be available in that dead root, um, which is which is in the soil? Some, so some of the nutrients would still be present in the root, and probably those that are down low would not be available. But some of the nutrients that are taken up by the root are then sent up to the biomass above ground biomass. And that's that mechanism where you are cycling, bringing it from depth up to the surface where it can be returned more into those surface layers. So those nutrients, yes, that ultimately end up in the biomass, they can be available. But yes, you're right. Some of the nutrients right down deep, still locked up in the root, would not be available to a short rooted annual afterwards. No. So I would say some yes, some no. Oh, thank you, Joel. Um, just a quick one. How damaging are artificial inputs on soil biology? Because you can spend a lot of time, a lot of money, like you were saying in the first session, in building up your biology in soil through um, compost extract and everything else. But then if you go and apply um, artificial fertilizers and pesticides, mm. are you then damaging that soil biology you've just created? <coughs> Good question. And of course, there's no easy answer to that one. Um, Often we hear in many circles how bad nitrogen is, how synthetic nitrogen is so bad for soil. I have a more nuanced view on this. Um, I think more, it's not that any nitrogen is bad. Uh, some nitrogen fertilizer can, can build soil organic matter, can increase microbial activity. If they are, nit if they are nitrogen starving and you deliver some of that nitrogen, you can actually increase microbial function, increase biomass from applications. So it's not to say that all nitrogen is bad. It's basically like a lot of things, there's a range. It's the over application of nitrogen that yes, is much more damaging. And there's a few reasons for that, just simply that sheer nutrient burden, the amount of nutrients in one short of time, it's just too much. Small uh, spoon fed doses of the exact same form of nitrogen spread out over time would cause absolutely no problem at all. But I know fa the practical reality of farming, we have to go out, minimize our passes over the field. So then some of those application rates are getting higher, which could be then damaging, but it's not inherently a something bad about the nitrogen per se, like a lot of things, um, dose makes the poison. And I think that um, it's another bit of a bigger discussion, but what's also clear is that excess nitrogen, although it's good at driving yield, it does that through increasing above ground biomass and that comes at a cost to the root biomass. And so this discussion about whether nitrogen builds or burns soil organic matter, for example, is also very nuanced. Um, sometimes it can increase soil organic matter by increasing residues and things back to the soil, but it can also suppress building of soil organic matter through suppression of root biomass. Um, and it's root biomass that's much more important for building that soil organic matter. So um, I wouldn't say that therefore it's all bad. I think the over application is more the concern, but then again, that depends on, on the soil type and how much nitrogen it can hold on to. There's many variables there, but um, I think over application is the concern. Some is still fine in my book. Yeah. Hi there. I had um, just a quick question about the um, overuse of um, added nitrogen in the soil, in the soil or on the plants. Mm -hmm. If the plant's infected with, say, a bacterial pathogen, mm -hmm. does then that increase the risk of that, that actually feeding the bacterial pathogen as well? So possibly, yeah. So uh, I guess that's a bit similar to the example I gave about the insects. Um, so there would be some nitrogen bearing defense chemicals and they could be increased if we use supply of nitrogen. And if that pathogen is susceptible to that, then that would be a good thing. Um, if that pathogen was susceptible to one of those non-nitrogen bearing, more carbon-based um, defense chemicals, then it could actually, that high nitrogen will be suppressing the production of those, therefore making things um, worse. So yeah, it's not a blanket rule that um, all nitrogen is bad. Sometimes nitrogen can help plant immunity, sometimes not. It kind of depends on the specific pathogen, the specific defense chemical. Um, do you have any specific advice for dealing with BYDV without resorting to insecticides? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, I've seen some stuff actually on, I'm sure there are some links particularly with nitrogen here actually is one that um, I'm sure, I, I don't have a super detailed answer for you, but I, I'm sure I've come across something about a links with nitrogen. 
Um, and I would say, I, I think that I would also be looking at some kind of seed treatment in terms of a nutritional seed treatment. I'm trying to get that on early um, before sowing so that, your pl so that the plants could actually have a better um, uptake of some of those other particularly things like trace elements, but some of the other nutrients there that can help that, um, the production of those defense chemicals. Um, but look, I, no, I, I don't have a I'd have to go do some digging to kind of find a, um, if there's anything out there. But I do have a memory that I've come across some links here with nitrogen um, before, but I, I, I don't have anything kind of concrete really to say. Um, I know that's a tricky one. This is a very um, difficult issue, I know, of course, yeah. Um, it, it does overlap with the discussion we had about insects because, of course, them as vectors. Um, so I would be focusing on some of the discussion there about preventing the insects, and we'd hope that that will also help to minimize some of the, some of the virus. Yeah. yeah, Joel, thank you very much for your lecture today. been very informative. Uh, could you, you were talking earlier on about molasses. Uh, could you bring us up to speed a little bit more of use when, uh, lock, perhaps if it can be locked up with other products being used, or also perhaps does hard water mixing it with it cause much problem should we be using more of a softer water for example mm. you know in high ca climatic uh, calcium yes yeah that's sure right. sure you. look molasses um, and some of those kind of carbon compounds that i mentioned um, i think i would be encouraging you to use a kind of a diversity of those they all do slightly different things provide different nutrients or different forms of carbon that can overall help. So I think a diversity of those carbon sources is a good strategy. But yes, molasses, the thing about molasses, it's a highly available sugar that microbes can quickly consume. It's very easy for them to digest it. So one of the benefits there of where and when I would use it is combining it especially with nitrogen fertilizers. And this is one of the reasons I'm a bit of a fan of liquid-based um, formulations, liquid strategies, liquid nitrogen, because then you can mix dissolve molasses in there or some of those other carbon compounds I mentioned where the carbon then can is acts like a sponge and can kind of bind to the nitrogen thereby making it more behave a bit more like an organic form so stabilizing it but particularly what it does is because the microbes in the soil are very hungry for carbon they love that molasses when you apply molasses with nitrogen the microbes will consume that molasses and also inadvertently consume the nitrogen at the same time. So this is a good thing because you are stabilizing the nitrogen into the body of the organism. Now this induces a short-term tie-up, but it's not like uh, the question we had there earlier about the manure management, too much carbon and straw, nitrogen drawdown. It's a good thing to get that nitrogen into the body of the organism because then the nitrogen is not going to be leachable or so prone to, to locking up. So you're getting the microbes to hold on to it. And we have some good studies that show exactly that, that the, the molasses stimulates biology to eat the nitrogen, thereby, for example, preventing leaching. We have some very good examples out of this. It, it would in a priming sense. So when if you have a complex carbon like straw, like a wired carbon to nitrogen ratio, so this is called priming. If you add something very small and simple like sugar, that provides an, a, a very easily digestible form of carbon for the microbes to get started and then carry on digesting the lignin and the more complex stuff. So it can be a primer of decomposition, yes, and it could be work, you could use it in that, in that regard. It'll stimulate microbial activity to to then stimulate the, uh, the digestion of the straw. Y you could probably also put a little bit of nitrogen with that because that nitrogen would also help that process too. So I would use a combination again of molasses and nitrogen to, to prime that digestion, but not much nitrogen, just a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's, how, that's the main area, how I would use something like molasses. I would be mixing it with fertilizers, with nutrients, always combining a carbon source with the nutrient source together. There's a lot of benefits that come from that. Was that it? I can't see any more hands. Oh, are we done? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.